me read this and we'll jump in together. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. And here we go. One of the Pharisees asked him, that being Jesus, to eat with them. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And they could not pay he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with oil. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we come to you and we ask for your help even as we look into your word. We ask that you would teach us and show us those things which we ought to see that we wouldn't ordinarily see on our own. So we ask for eyes to see and for hearts to understand. And we, we pray for a softening of our hearts and for an opening of our ears and that you would provide the construction and the encouragement that we need in and through your word. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we get started, I want you to think about for a moment what would it be like if you were invited to different social gatherings in different contexts, the way you dress, the way you show up, depending on where you're invited to and what type of gathering it is, it changes our expectations for what we think we would see and experience and witness when we show up to a social gathering. So if you could just imagine that you've been invited to different functions in your life, what would you wear? What would it look like? What would you expect to see? How would you expect the people around you to act? If this was like a Friday night with friends, no kids, uh, and, and somebody's cooking good food in their uh, kitchen or maybe on the backyard grill, and, and you as adults are just going to enjoy the evening together, what would, you, what would you wear? What would you expect people to do? How would you think people would act? Close friends. How would it change? And I don't know why, you know, I would never get invited to a gathering like this, but, you know, I don't know if, like, before the State of the Union, you know, the president uh, has people over to his house for dinner, like, hey, let, I'm going to go get a speech, come on. What, what would you wear? What would you expect to see? How would people act at that kind of a function? Did any of you do this last night? What would it be like, if, you know, if you were getting friends over to watch the Phillies upset the Cardinals and advance to the next round of the playoffs, right? Did anybody, anybody watch that? Say it? I thought there'd be a few more Phillies fans in the room. I'm a Cardinal hater, so go Phillies. I mean, that was awesome. <laughs> Depending on the type of social gathering and, and the expectations that people have, it's gonna change the way that, that people act around you. So in Luke 7, Jesus gets invited to a dinner party. And there are certain things that you would have expected to see at that dinner party that you don't see. They're very conspicuous. And if you and I had been in this type of a culture, it would be so glaringly obvious, wait a minute, at this type of gathering, 
There were certain things that you were expecting to see, you would have wanted to see, it would have been unthinkable that you didn't see them. And sure enough, for whatever reason, at this dinner party, those things didn't happen. No one saw them. There's other kinds of things at a dinner party like this that everyone would bet money on the fact you would never see. And guess what? That's what everyone saw. And why? Why did this happen? And what does it tell us about who the person of Jesus is? We need to know and understand why did Jesus do this? Luke is recording these stories because he wants the person named Theophilus, who the book is written to, and the Holy Spirit wants you and I, the readers, to go through this and to draw conclusions. Who is Jesus? What kind of person is he? Why would Jesus do something like this at these type of events? Why would Jesus do what he does here? Why would the people who gathered do and not do some of the things that happened? And it leaves the reader and those who were at the dinner party, they had to draw a conclusion. Who is Jesus? What type of person is he? And there were some in this group who looked at Jesus and their hearts rang with that truth. How marvelous, how wonderful. And there were others in the group whose hearts were so hardened that their hearts did not ring with the truth of who Jesus is. And Luke intends for you and I to come to the conclusion, where do we think? Where do we fit in? Which one of the two are we? So let's go through the story, and I want you to see exactly the picture that Luke paints through what Jesus does here at this dinner party. Look in Luke chapter 7, and I'm going to start in verse 36, and let's walk through it so you can understand what happens at this dinner party. One of the Pharisees asked him, that's Jesus, to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now there's several things taking place here at this dinner party, and there's several of them that you and I don't understand, because the way we do dinner parties looks nothing like the way this group of people do, did at dinner parties. It's important to note that Jesus goes to the home of a Pharisee. Remember, throughout the life of Jesus in his early ministry and what leads to his eventual crucifixion is this growing confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders. The Pharisees, who you and I think of as those bad, evil people that killed Jesus, in that day, they were not thought of as bad, evil people. They were the good, righteous people. They were the ones who people assumed were close to God. They kept all of the rules. They, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were very particular about following God's laws. And so when Jesus, this new rabbi or teacher, he's called a rabbi later on in the parable, when he shows up on the scene and he's going into the synagogues and he's teaching from town to town, well, the Pharisees would have paid attention to this new teacher that was making waves as people began to follow and as Jesus' reputation begins to grow, the Pharisees would have wanted to know who is Jesus because we're not sure we like him because he seems to poke at us. He seems to expose the, the, our hearts because the religious leaders, the Pharisees, thought they were the best at following Jesus. They thought they were pure. They thought they were good before God. And Jesus comes along and he begins to expose your hearts aren't as pure as you think they are. So there's this growing clash between Jesus and the Pharisees. The other thing you need to know that's happening by this point in the gospel, Jesus' reputation is growing, it's widening, his influence is growing. All of Luke chapter 7, Luke is recording these things that are answering this question, who is Jesus? Because Luke wants the reader to come to that conclusion about who Jesus is. So, Jesus is performing miracles throughout Luke chapter 7. John the Baptist is actually asking this question. Who is Jesus? He sends messengers and says, are you the one we're supposed to be waiting for? And as Jesus answers that question, one of the things you see in verse 34 of chapter 7, Jesus notes that his reputation is such that people are paying attention to the fact that he's a friend of sinners. 
And that's not what good people thought good people did. The Pharisees, the best of the best, the righteous, assumed that whenever the Messiah showed up, he wouldn't be a friend of sinners, because the Pharisees weren't friends of sinners. The Pharisees loved following and honoring God's laws, and here comes Jesus, who seems to be shaking things up. He's continuing to grow his influence in ministry, and so the Pharisees invite Jesus, the Pharisees, particularly name is Simon, we're going to learn. They have him over for a meal. Whether or not this happens after teaching in the synagogue, we're not sure of the occasion and why the people come in, but what would happen at an event like this? We're told that not only are the dinner guests there, but there's a woman of the city who's there. And we're told that she's a from the city, and we're told that she is a sinner. Now, very likely what's taking place is Luke, in a very delicate way, is telling us that she's a very publicly known sinner in the city. And whatever it was that led to her sins, everyone knew her reputation in the city. Very likely, she was an immoral woman, and that was her profession, how she made her living. And now she's here at this dinner. Now, you and I would look at that and say, wait a minute, what's going on? Why are there dinner guests? And why is this woman of the city there? Well, one thing that's different for you and I as compared to them, the, the public entertainment of a dinner party was exactly that. It was a public entertaining thing. What would happen as, as the host, Simon being the host, would invite guests into his home and the front door would remain open. Anybody that wanted to come off the street could come into whether this was happening in a courtyard or what it might be. And there would be a long, either a low table or more often the, the bowls would just be set down on the middle of the floor. And the dinner guests would come and they would recline at the table. They would lay on their left side facing the table with their feet extended out away from the table. And that's how they would partake of their meal. And it was sort of a who's who event in terms of who got invited and why they were there and what they were talking about. So as the prominent guests are reclining at the table, the people from the city would just come in and watch and they would observe and they would know what was taking place. So you and I think it's strange that this woman shows up. They would not have thought it strange that there was public gathering where people were watching. It would be unusual, however, that someone of this reputation would show up. And then she would show up to watch when everybody says, wait a minute, these are the religious people, and this is a religious teacher, and she's here. That would be unusual. The other thing that's very unusual, you know how when you show up at someone's house, even in our culture today, there's a certain ritual that takes place when you ring the doorbell or you knock on the door and you were told to show up for a 7 o'clock dinner or whatever it might be, and you ring the doorbell and your host there's these things that we go through, right? It's expected that the host will answer the door and be the one that will let you in, and, and the, your coats are taken and they're prepared in a place. Uh, uh, that was my job as a kid, run the coats upstairs to mom and dad's bed. Like, that's where all the coats went, the mound of coats. And, and there'd be some greeting, maybe a handshake or a hug or this kind of thing. One of the things that's pretty cool here on the East Coast, there's like often, not always, but sometimes there's like a gift that the person showing up brings to the host. And like that, that doesn't happen in other places around the country, but good on you for doing that kind of stuff. It's pretty fun to see. And uh, if, if that stuff is, if all of it is, it, not every single aspect of it is expected every single time, but if, if in its entirety, every single aspect of the, those greetings was left off, it would be strange. Like if you ring the doorbell and nobody lets you in, and the host never says hi, and there's six places seated at the table, and yours isn't one of them, and the host is like scrambling to set up an extra chair on the card table for the side, you would feel awkward and out of place, right? That's what's going on here. Because of living in the society that they were with the dirt roads, the animals walking down the roads, people's feet were filthy and dirty, and foot washing was a very normal, ordinary, customary thing. Often the host certainly would not be the one to wash the feet. That would be something that a servant would do, or at minimum, depending on the stature of the person who was invited to the meal, uh, there would at least be bowls of water where you could wash your own feet. None of that is provided for Jesus. We're not told whether or not it was provided for the rest of the guests. In our culture, there might be a handshake or a hug. Not so in their culture, there would be kisses of greetings. That doesn't happen here. 
And, and so you see things taking place. There would often also be an anointing with oil, where the head would be placed with a drop of oil. There would be this anointing that was very common and customary. And the, uh, that doesn't happen for Jesus either. Well, this woman of ill reputation shows up. And she is so overcome in the moment with her love for Jesus. And whether or not she catches the slight towards Jesus, there's no indication in the text that she's trying to rectify a wrong. It could simply be her love for Jesus. She, knowing that this hasn't happened for Jesus, she's going to show her love to him. Well, how is she going to do this, right? She's, she's a bystander, and there's a meal going on. And Jesus' feet are outstretched, and especially with her character, at this point, to walk up in the middle of a meal and to kiss Jesus on the head or something like this, well, that would be kind of awkward, but she could at least kind of get close to his feet if they're outstretched. And she cries not just a little. Like, don't think of this as a sentimental moment where there's a tear running down her cheek, you know, and uh, that's not what's taking place. She's crying so much that she is... There's enough tears to wash Jesus' feet. Uh, the, t the word that's used in the text for this is used of rain showers and the amount of rain that would happen, the amount of water that would come through rain. She is weeping over Jesus' feet. That probably is coming with noise. It's probably making a commotion. And it's probably getting awkward, not just for Simon, but especially for Simon, for other people watching. So now... You've got to figure, how is Simon going to respond to this, okay? Not only does she cry, but she then washes Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair. Now, for you and I, we don't think anything of that for a woman to have long enough hair that she could use it in that way. But in that culture, it would have been scandalous and unthinkable for a woman to let down her hair. Grounds for divorce in some circumstances. So here's this woman who throws caution to the wind. and She already knows people don't respect her. And she loves Jesus, so she's going to wash his feet. She's going to wipe his feet with her hair. She's going to anoint his feet, not just with oil, but with costly perfume. Olive oil was inexpensive. It was very abundant. That's usually how the anointing happened. But she brings a very costly ointment in an alabaster last and this perfume would have been very costly and she kisses Jesus feet and she anoints them with this point so how's the host going to respond to this right if you're a host and you forget to do something and you notice one of your other guests does it for this person who shows up like you know most of us if we're humble or if we recognize the awkwardness of the moment we might uh, humbly try to thank our guest for providing what we lacked in that moment. That's not the way Simon responds. He doesn't try to save face and say thanks to this woman for honoring his guests. You notice what he does? He has this arrogant, judgmental, critical, cynical response where he just responds in his heart. And this is what he says in verse 39. <coughs> Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Simon takes note of everything. He says, Wait a minute. I got it. Dead to rights. This guy who's coming in and he's shaking things up, he's not a prophet. He doesn't know things. There's two judgments that Simon's making here. Number one, he's saying Jesus is not a prophet. Number two, he's saying good people don't hang out with bad people. That's the two judgments Simon is making. He's saying Jesus can't be a prophet because if he were, he would know the evil heart of this woman. Secondly, all of us good people know you don't hang out with bad people like this. Jesus would probably rebuke her. If Jesus really were a prophet, he would call into judgment her sinful lifestyle. He wouldn't let her touch her. He wouldn't let her make a public fool of herself in front of everyone. And, John, and Simon thinks, aha, in his arrogance, in his hard-heartedness, there's no way he's a prophet. Now Jesus is going to respond, and he's going to respond to both accusations in a way that exposes the truth of the situation. Jesus is going to say, I do know hearts, Simon. 
I know yours and the woman's, and I am a prophet. And here's how Jesus responds. Notice it then in verse 40. Um, Jesus answering him said to him, now remember, Simon didn't ask a question. He said it in his heart, and yet Luke tells us Jesus is going to answer the thoughts of his heart. And he says this, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Jesus is not asking for permission to speak. In the culture, this would have been a blunt way of saying, I have a blunt message, and you're going to listen to it. That's what Jesus is saying. I got something to say to you. Here's what Jesus says. I'm going to read verses 41 to 43. It's this little parable. Last week, Pastor Kevin walked us through uh, the parable of the sower, which is right on the heels of this at the start of chapter 8. So this is almost like a little mini parable to get the parable started in Luke. When I first read this, my thought was, that's not a parable. It's just like three verses. Like it's such a tiny little story in the midst of this drama scenario. And by the time I got done studying it, I was like, the greatest parable Jesus ever told. It's so neat to see what Jesus does with this tiny story to expose hearts and to compare the, the heart of Simon with the heart of this woman. And here's what Jesus says. A certain money lender had two debtors, one over 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Sheer grace. There's nothing on the part of either debtor that was grounds for the money lender canceling the debts. Two different sides of debts, and neither one could pay, and just out of an act of kindness and grace, both debts are forgiven. Now, which of them will love him more? Jesus is drawing the conclusion, and it would be a correct assumption that what's going to happen in this scenario is out of love, there's going to be this gratitude shown for this kindness of canceling the debt. Which one will love more? Now, Simon has to answer carefully whether or not he understands where Jesus is going, or if he's just being diplomatic, but he chooses his words carefully, and he says, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. He said to him, you have judged rightly. This is Jesus' point. There's two debtors, 10 times the size of a debt. A denarii was a common day's wage for the average worker or for a soldier. So if you were to take 50 days wages versus 500, what you're dealing with is something like two months of wages as compared to more than a year and a half, not quite two years of wages. One commentator used the illustration, you're looking at like a car loan being canceled versus a home mortgage being canceled. So neither one is small, but one is significantly larger than the other. And, and Simon gets this. Wait a minute. There's going to be more gratitude for the one who has the larger debt canceled. And that's Jesus' point. And he's going to take that parable. And his illustration and his point is... There are two groups of sinners in the room, and Simon is so concerned with these outward public known sins of the woman, and Jesus is going to say, wait a minute, when God steps in, and when God forgives sins, it changes hearts such that there's gratitude and love shown back to the debt forgiver, to the debt canceler, when one understands that their sins have been forgiven. Look how Jesus responds in verse 44. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Notice what Jesus says, right? So you've got Simon and you've got the woman, right? And Jesus turns to the woman and he says to Simon, notice what's happening. He's, he's looking at the woman. He's drawing attention to the woman, but he's calling Simon out. And he's speaking directly to Simon. And this is what he says. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You were the host. It was your job to do the things that the host usually does. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Notice what Jesus is doing. Jesus is calling out the host. This is awkward. Put yourself in that situation. What happens every time you are wrapping up a dinner party, right? If you're the host, or, or if you're the guest, right? You're a guest in someone's home. They've just shown you hospitality. 
Maybe they got a couple things wrong, right? Maybe the chicken was a little overdone and a little dry, but what do you say? Thank you so much. That was delicious. That was the best chicken I have ever had. You've got to send me your recipe, right? That's your obligation, right? You've got to work overtime to make sure the host knows I wasn't worthy of your hospitality. Like, you just showered kindness on me. That's, that's the exchange. That's what we feel like, right? Jesus doesn't do any of that. This is like a mic drop moment, okay? Burn, as the kids say, okay? Uh, Jesus is the guest, and he's like, listen, Simon, you're the host. You want to talk to me about, about how you think my heart's in the wrong place and how I don't know this woman? It was your job to give me a greeting. Nothing. There was no kiss. And Jesus is being really careful here. Even in exposing Simon. Jesus is not being arrogant. He's not being haughty. He's not being presumptuous. Notice what he says in the text. He doesn't say, you didn't wash my feet. It wouldn't have been the host's job to do that. He just says, you didn't provide water. Jesus assumes he could have washed his own feet or that a servant could have done this. And he also says, you gave me no kiss. Now, there would have been a, uh, a social... Uh, pecking order for how the kiss would have been delivered in a greeting. If, if they were peers, it could have been uh, a kiss on the cheek, or if you particularly wanted to honor someone, the host could kiss the forehead. In a rabbi, in a teacher setting, the young men of the house would have been ex expected to not kiss on the cheek, but to gather around the rabbi and to kiss on the hand. Uh, it would have been showing honor to someone who was greater. Jesus doesn't say, you didn't kiss my hand, though he, right, he rightly could have called Simon out for that. He just simply says, there was no kiss of greeting, right? And this woman does that. She washes my feet with her tears. It wasn't that, that Jesus' head wasn't anointed with inexpensive olive oil. No, this woman anoints his feet with the costly perfume for which there would have been no precedent. And Jesus says, this woman does something you didn't even come close to. And notice how highly exalted the place of the woman is here in this account in Luke and in several places throughout the gospel. You would have expected in a society that was dominated by men, certainly Simon had the reputation of being righteous. He had the reputation of being a leader in the community. And Jesus exposes him as a fraud. And the woman who had the reputation of being a sinner and a fraud, well, Jesus highly lifts her up. He says, look what she's done. And Jesus says, do you get it? This woman, who everyone recognizes as a sinner, why does she love so much? Because she understands God's forgiveness. She understands who Jesus is. And here's how Luke goes on to record this, what Jesus says then in verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives Sins. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus is going to make crystal clear this woman's love is a demonstration of the forgiveness that she's received. That's why she says how marvelous, how wonderful. And she says it with her tears. She says it with her kisses. She says it with the anointing of Jesus' feet. Notice what's happening here. I want you to catch this. Notice it is not her actions that produce the forgiveness that Jesus grants. Her actions are the result of her forgiveness. Look in verse 50, what Jesus says in verse 50, he says to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Her faith is what made her righteous, her faith in who Jesus was. So this very likely is not the first meeting between Jesus and the woman. She perhaps has heard his teaching from afar. Perhaps she has already understood forgiveness. She has already turned from the ways, and though the people don't know that, she is still seen as a sinner in the community. And now this woman comes here because she hears that Jesus is at the table. 
and she wants to show her love. She wants to express her love. She, the actions, her actions are not the reason for her forgiveness, but it's the result of her sins being forgiven. There's a man named Daryl Bach. He illustrates this principle by saying, you can take the statement, it's raining because the windows are wet. That statement does not mean that the water on the windows is the cause of the rain. The water on the windows is evidence of the presence of rain. This woman loves much because she's been forgiven much. It's not her actions of love that produce her forgiveness, it's her faith. And then Jesus also helps Simon see, listen, the one who's been forgiven much will love much, and the one who's been forgiven little will love little. Now, there's a couple ways to take that statement as, as Jesus is just drilling this home to Simon, and you've got to ask this question and saying, okay, there's two ways to look at this. Is Jesus saying, Simon, you're a good guy, you're righteous, you've sinned a little, therefore you don't have much love to show. I don't think that's the best way to understand this. Uh, I think the real way to look at this is Jesus has just pointed out Simon is a sinful guy. He doesn't understand God's love. In his arrogance, in his hard-heartedness, he doesn't respond to Jesus' forgiveness. And in his sins, though they're quieter than the woman's, though they're not as well known as the woman's, he's a sinner. He's just as much in need of forgiveness as the woman. But because of he doesn't understand God's forgiveness. Therefore, he doesn't love. He's hard-hearted. Right. Now think then also about the way, the last thing we need to see is the way people respond. What happens? People are around the table and they're saying, whoa, who is Jesus? He just claimed to forgive sins. That hugely elevates the status of who Jesus is. He's not just an influential teacher. Only God can forgive sins. And now Jesus says, there's two things that we learn about Jesus in this passage, and I want you to get this, all right? Who is Jesus? He knows hearts, and he can forgive sins. Do you get that this morning? Do you know that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, God knows your hearts. He knows the standing of your hearts. He knows the thoughts that you have had already this morning. He knows the thoughts that you have had during this message. He knows the words that were spoken before you came to service this morning. He knows all of my actions this week. He knows all of your actions this week. And for you and I, apart from Jesus Christ, that leaves us in a position of condemned, judged. We can't measure up to a righteous and holy God. And yet, because God knows hearts and he wants a right relationship with us, that's why Jesus came. Imagine. Jesus came as God's son. And you're going to see the end of this confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees where Jesus is crucified on a cross, a righteous man dying in the sinner's place so that Christ's death on the cross serves as a substitution, as payment for the sins that you and I, for the punishment of sins that you and I rightly deserve. And Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again. Jesus is alive. It's what we celebrate at Easter. And the good news of the gospel is that any of us who turn from our sins and place our faith and trust in Christ can receive this life, this forgiveness, this hope. Have you done that? I urge you to if you haven't turned to Christ for salvation. There are only one of two places that you are this morning. You're either still in your sin apart from Christ and in rebellion, and you will suffer eternity separated from Christ, or you are redeemed, forgiven, saved in relationship with God. That's the only two places you can be this morning. Right. And if Jesus is a God who knows hearts and forgives sins, let me give you a litmus test for how you can evaluate which one of those two camps am I in. Here's some evidence that will help speak towards that, right? We demonstrate that we know and understand who Jesus is, that he's a God who forgives, that he's a God who knows hearts. We know and we demonstrate that when our life looks more like the woman's than it does Simon's. When we overflow with our love for God, when our life is a, when our life is a poetic, how marvelous, how wonderful, 
When our song is always, God, I love you, I'm all in, I want to live for you, I want my life to be an expression of love for you, that's how we demonstrate that God knows hearts and forgives. That's how we demonstrate that we understand that, that our hearts have been changed. But far too often, the temptation for you and I, and for some that even think they're Christians, they think they're in this camp, but their life demonstrates their assignment. They're through and through assignment. Their heart is hard. Sure, they can recite facts about the gospel, they can recite intellectual truths, but their heart doesn't sing how marvelous. Their heart doesn't sing how wonderful. The inner thoughts of their heart is, how dare Jesus, if he was really a prophet might not let those thoughts come out of their heart about Jesus, but they certainly do in relation to other things spiritual. Do you see Simon in yourself? Luke recorded this for us because he wants the reader to draw this conclusion. The Holy Spirit is recording these things for you and I to say, are we more like the woman or are we more like Simon? Jesus is who our hearts are supposed to be changed by. The evidence that our hearts have been changed by Jesus are when we look more like the woman instead of Simon. So here's Simon in his judgmental, critical, cynical, hardened heart. He's drawing these wrong conclusions about who Jesus is. Thomas Watson, uh, going back to one of the Puritans, said this, Satan has two places he dwells. Hell and a hard heart. We should not be like Simon, who relies on his own perceived self-righteousness. He relies on his own performance of righteous standing before God. He's in total contrast to the woman who has no righteous reputation. She has nothing that she can give to God except for her tears, except for the ointment that she brings, except for her hair. And Simon probably thinks, look at my resume. It's so long, I'm going to invite you into a dinner, and I'm going to embarrass you. That's what Simon thinks. And God says, no, it's Simon who has a hard heart. It's this arrogant, judgmental heart of Simon who assumes the worst about Jesus. Far too often, I, I know I'm tempted in my life, and I see it in the lives of professing Christians, that we say, uh, on the one hand, we want to say, I love Jesus, but we have that arrogant, judgmental, assume the worst about God's people, about the loved ones in our life, about our spouse or our children or our friends, and we ought not be these kind of arrogant, foolish, Proverbs calls them scoffers, Proverbs calls them fools, Proverbs has much to say about what you see happening in the heart of Simon. In Proverbs chapter 26, Here's what it says in verse 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs does not give much hope to the place of a fool. And yet Proverbs says there's more hope for someone who's wise in their own eyes. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. A fool has no desire to know the things of God and to understand the truth, but only to express his own opinion. Here's Simon, face to face with Jesus. Wouldn't there be some, hey Jesus, could you explain what you just did? Like this is confusing to me because she's kind of a bad person and I didn't think good people were supposed to be around bad people. Like, could you help me understand? There's none of that on Simon's part. He jumps to his own conclusion. In his heart, he expresses his own opinion with no desire to know the truth. Oh, that you and I would not be like this. Brothers and sisters, we've got to guard against all arrogant judgmentalism that just assumes the worst, that takes Jesus' forgiveness for granted. Shouldn't we show to others the same kind of grace and love that God has shown to us that we wouldn't assume the worst? I'm not saying we ignore sin. I'm not saying we treat it lightly. I am saying we don't arrogantly assume that we know all. We don't arrogantly assume that we would be in the place of correcting when we actually need to be in the place of 
understanding. Guard against this because this creeps into the church at all levels. You see this across all spectrums of what it means to be a part of the church. It, on this side of the spectrum, it doesn't matter if you're a leader in the church, an elder, a pastor, or if you're all the way over here where you're just a casual consumer who does nothing more than slip in and slip out without talking to anyone. On all ends of that spectrum and involvement of the church, you can find elements of Simonism, Phariseeism, legalism, this judgmental, critical spirit. It doesn't matter if you're in the pews every single Sunday. It doesn't matter if you're here once a month. It doesn't matter if this is, has been something that has kept people out of the pews for decades. You see Simonism, Phariseeism, legalism creeping into hearts, and we've got to repent of it. Allow God to expose us of it. Now, let me give just a, a particular warning to, to my, my generation. I see if you're not, and particularly if you're a male in my generation, a decade either side of me, I'll let you guess what you think that is. Right? <laughs> if you're not in that group, you're not off the hook. Okay, you're not off the hook because this happens for our sisters as well. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are, you'll get caught up in this. I just have been around uh, Shawnee long enough that I talk at, at times, at times I see this particularly in, in, my, in my group, uh, in, particularly for the men. I think we're susceptible sometimes to some of this judgmentalism, cynicism. We almost wear it as a, as a mask of, of keep, I don't know if, it, if it's been hurt in the past that allows us to keep God from doing the good things that, that, that we try to guard defenses up. And so we say, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna kind of stiffen my neck is what Proverbs would call it. I'm going to put up a mask that, that doesn't let God work. Not that God is powerless to our work, but I think you know what I mean in terms of our part in the process. Let, let me just plead with you. Don't, don't do that. Like, don't do that. Um, be tender. Uh, let, God, let God work. Um, don't, don't jump to arrogant conclusions. Um, and if you're wondering, is that me? Am I there? Um, the cool thing for you, in, in what I'm describing with this arrogant judgmentalism that Proverbs talks about as, as scoffing, scoffers won't listen. Uh, so if, if you're the worst of the worst that I've described this morning, you haven't heard what I've said. You've probably been, been mocking it. Um, and so I say it somewhat for the benefit of those who are listening just to be able to judge. We, we need to be able to discern people's hearts to, okay, are we dealing with a sign in here? Are we dealing with a loving woman? But if, if, if your heart is still sensitive enough that you've heard and you think there's conviction, well, like, praise God. Only God can do that. You're not, you're not yet the hardened fool. Um, ask, repent. Like, ask God, God, I, I, I want to say how marvelous. I want to say how wonderful. I want to be so in love with you that I look at what Jesus has done and the things he's forgiven me of, and I would say, yes, God, make me loving. God, make me as forgiving to others as you have been to me. Look at the woman in this passage. She loves and it's born out of forgiveness. She's all in. She's completely devoted. She says, yeah, I'm the worst of the worst, but this guy is the best of the best and I love. I love. And I show that love to others. That's what should happen in our hearts. This is Paul's argument in Romans 5, 6, and 7, right? That where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. If you haven't yet dealt with your own, I'm, I'm speaking to professing Christians, right? You haven't fully understood your sin and the grace that God provides through the person of Jesus Christ to realize this forgiveness and to revel in it and to grow in your love of God. Well, you're in danger of letting the heart get hard. You're in danger of letting some of this judgmentalism creep in. And you need to focus on Jesus. How do you overcome this Simonism, Phariseeism, legalism that I'm speaking about, right? If, if you see some of that in your heart, because frankly, all of us are there to one extent or the other, and this needs to be rooted out at various times in our lives. But especially if, if you're noticing, wait a minute, okay, I think that I should do some heart surgery in this area. The Holy Spirit needs to work on me. How is it that you're going to go from being a Simon to being a woman loving and overflowing with love and because of the forgiveness, right? You won't do it by focusing on not being a Simon, right? If you don't want to be Simon, don't try extra hard not to be Simon, right? 
Sometimes people that are so concerned with Phariseeism, legalism, judgmentalism at times, if you focus on just not doing that, you might actually end up becoming more judgmental, right? What has to happen? The focus has to be on Jesus, right? Not on trying to not be a Simon. The focus has to be on who is Jesus, right? What has he done? What does the woman do? She could care less about all the judgmental, pharisaical people in the room. She falls at Jesus' feet and says, this is where God's spirit resides. This is where true love comes from. This is where forgiveness is flowing from. If you want to be like the woman, focus on Jesus. Don't focus on not trying to be Simon. Look at Jesus and just say, read books on the gospel. Focus on Romans. Go through the gospel and the account of what Jesus has done for you. That's why we're going to walk through the parables. The, 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 the parables. We want you to see who Jesus is and just be able to say, wow, that's his love. That's his grace. That's his forgiveness. I want to grow it. I want to know more of it. I want to be able to say how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. I once was an enemy, but now I'm seated at the table. And our hearts just say, Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. That's what we're going to sing together. Father, we come to you. We want to see more of Jesus. We want us to know more of what Jesus has done for us in the gospel and the love and the forgiveness that he's shown to us. Help us to realize the magnitude of the debt that's been forgiven on our behalf and that our hearts would overflow with that love. Father, I pray that, that you would be with those in the room this morning that are responding to that question of who is Jesus. If there are those who are not saved, they're not Christians, they've never turn from their sin and place their trust in Christ. Would they do that even now? That in their hearts they would say, God, I'm a sinner and I want to stop and I, I trust in what Christ has done for me on the cross. I, I believe in Christ's death on my behalf, his burial, his resurrection. I want to follow him with all of my days. Would they cry out to you for salvation, Father? For those of us that are Christians, I pray that our focus would be so in tune with Jesus that our hearts would look like the woman's and not like Simon's. Do that as we focus on Jesus. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.